Hello, I am Sienna Sophia Burt, and I am here today to talk to Davy Rothbart about his documentary 17 Blocks, which is just opening in theaters and um, is getting its digital release worldwide. Um, and Davy is really a jack of all trades. He's got a long list of credits as a filmmaker, an author, and a publisher. Prior to 17 Blocks, he directed three other documentary features in one docu-series, including Medora, which I believe you were um, you filmed and completed at the same time that you were filming footage for 17 Blocks, right? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, um, definitely. Well, this this 17 Blocks has been underway for 20 years, so uh, <laughs> other projects were coming and projects going under... during that time, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, some of his other titles are Independent Lens and Another Station, Another Mile. He's also the creator of Found Magazine, which is a publication that sources discarded written material from readers for its contribution, which is a strategy kind of reminiscent of 17 Block's own collaborative origins. He's also the author of a collection of short stories called The Lone Surfer of Montana, Kansas, out of which three stories have been optioned for adaptation by Steve Buscemi. He's also a contributor to This American Life. Uh, and, and, and which I wrote, which I wrote in, sorry to interrupt, but no, I, that's, I wrote that book in Taos, New, Mex wow. New Mexico. So, oh, I love so that. It has, uh, so it has some special, Northern New Mexico has special connection for me. Very cool. Too, How long yeah. were you in Taos for? Uh, I lived there for a year. Uh, awesome. About 20 oh, years ago, yeah. I love that, that local connection. Very cool. Um, and you're also a contributor to This American Life, and you've even appeared as an actor in The Strongest Man, and as a documentary subject yourself in the 2011 film My Heart is an Idiot, which is also named after an essay collection of yours. Um, but of course, we're here today to talk about 17 Blocks and to give a little bit of backstory on the film. Um, this was shot in collaboration with its subjects, the Sanford family, as you mentioned, over the course of 20 years. And it mixes over a thousand hours of footage, some of it shot by professionals, some captured on camcorders by the Sanfords themselves. And its title comes from the distance between the Sanfords home and the US Capitol, 17 blocks, which is obviously an especially timely namesake now for a film that was initially scheduled for pre-pandemic release before all of this unrest around the Capitol. Um, and the film True. itself empathetically follows four generations of the family as their lives are being profoundly altered by the systemic violence and drug use that's harming communities of color so close to the heart of the nation. Um, it's an incredibly powerful film. I really appreciated um, some of the unique storytelling techniques that I, I think sort of um, manifested through this in incredibly collaborative process of filmmaking. But before we dive into talking about that, I wanted to start off by asking you, kind of based off of the title, um, given that title 17 Blocks, it seems pretty clear that this is a film with a, a pretty deep concern for location. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little about the role that place played in the creation of this film, the specificity of this particular neighborhood and this particular street in your approach to telling this story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Sienna, and and thank you for um, the generous introduction and 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 you know your response to the film that that's really appreciated and and just what you what you what you are clearly seeing in the film, which isn't always um, explicit, but is, right. is are the themes that that that, that the film we, we hoped it would speak to you know are these these more systemic and institutional challenges. So, um, you know, there are. Around the United States, there are a lot of neighborhoods um, in cities um, that that are like the neighborhood where the Sanford family has lived in, in DC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, neighborhoods that um, get the short end of the stick in many ways um, and, and and have all these related um, problems basically be, because of that. Right. Uh, yet there's something dramatic about, to me, about the fact that this neighborhood, which you know, is, is has struggled in so many ways is really literally in the shadow of the US Capitol building. So it's like the halls of power where decisions are made about how resources are allocated. You know, those are us literally, you know, the stone's throw. You can it's go in, by, in their backyard and see the Capitol building rising right. down Pennsylvania Avenue from their street. And so so the title, you know, was chosen in, in a way, yeah, as, as that the film itself really tries to center on just the family story. And that was a decision we, we all made together. And thank you for acknowledging just how deeply collaborative this process has been. You know, um, it, it's a movie that we, we the Sanford's uh, 
Cheryl, Smurf, Denise, Emmanuel, Justin, you know, that's a film we've, we've worked together on for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, you know, the, the story really focuses on the family, but the title, 17 Blocks, is a bit of a provocation and a challenge, you know, to, the, to those people, the politicians in that building, you know, mm -hmm. to, to pay attention to communities like where the Sanford lives, it's, you know, especially this one that's, you know, out their door. Right. Um, and, and, and also in some ways a challenge to anyone watching it to ask those questions like what what can we do to uh, create more opportunities for kids like Emmanuel and, and Justin, you know, Absolutely. and others that are growing up in, in, in neighborhoods like this. Well, and I, I think that that provocation came across really powerfully and effectively, not just through the title, but obviously through your filmmaking and through um, the selection of footage in particular, which I can only imagine how difficult that was with all of this raw material to work on, figuring out what parts are going to best convey both this, um, this particular family story and also the story of, um, as you said, all of these other neighborhoods across the nation that are facing sort of parallel struggles. Um, and I also, I, I was curious because I know this film started as a collaboration um, when you, Smurf, and Emmanuel were just sort of getting to know each other as friends. At what point in the process of kind of just goofing around filming each other the way friends do, did it switch from that kind of casual approach to it to, oh, there's a documentary here, there's a story I want to tell, and how did that approach kind of change or morph over the course of this 20-year process? Totally. I mean, yeah, like you said, it, it, when it started out, we were we were friends, you know, the family, they like to, Cheryl likes to say they adopted me, which is Aww. how it felt really, you know, I, I was, I was far from home and probably in need of some family and, and mm -hmm. they really um, looked out, looked out for me and, and brought me right in. And so, um, you know, the, the camera was just filming with something fun we did. It, it was one activity among many, you know, right. but we, especially Emmanuel, who was nine when we started, you know, he, he really took to, filmmaking and, and and using the camera and 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 we, and he really had a poetic eye and and we film ly lyrical footage you know and so um but you know for years it continued like that essentially home videos you know and maybe you know something slightly elevated but with no real plan in place or not what we would ever do with all this footage um right. and then i i would say you know everything really changed the night emmanuel passed away you know because i i, I I was home in Michigan and I, I got back to DC the next day and uh, Cheryl said, where's the camera? And I, oh, I was like, wow. what do you mean? You know, she, she said, she said, she immediately had this sort of wisdom and foresight. You know, she just said like, look, this happens to so many, so many of my friends have lost kids mm -hmm. to gun violence. You know, this is so common around here, but no one that she knew of, you know, no one has ever been documented so thoroughly throughout their whole life. Right. She kind of put the, connected the dots and she was like, people outside the neighborhood will, will understand the story and, and what's, she said, I need people to understand what's really going on, you mm -hmm. know? And she said, she knew that having all that footage of Emmanuel over the years would help convey at least one family's individual story to the point where people could have a broader sense of this, the vast scope of this issue. Wow. And so, so she, she knew the pain she was gonna be walking through in the weeks and months to come. She'd see she'd see friends go through it herself. And mm -hmm. she said, let's film everything. And so me and, and Smurf and Denise and others, you know, continued to film. And and then we just never really knew when to stop. So right. we kept going after that for years and years and to the point, I think it was when when the next generation, you know, when Denise's son Justin and Smurf's sons Akil and Junior and uh and Kale when they got to be the age like that that Emmanuel Smurf and Denise had been when I first met them like you could just see that things had kind of come full circle and Absolutely. and we were like all right well now we have how you know a thousand hours of footage of what story do we want to tell and so that was another interesting part of it was just um having those conversations with the Sanfords about you know how do what what what, what aspects of the story are most important and what and, mm -hmm. and how do we pick and choose which elements of the story to, to, to piece together into the film. Right, well, and that, that was a question that kept sort of running through my mind after, while I was watching the film, but especially after, of, you know, you really get the sense watching it that there are multiple 
authorial voices behind the camera, that there are, you're getting different perspectives on the same events, um, kind of enmeshing and weaving with each other. And given how many people took turns behind the camera, I was so curious about the editing process. And I noticed that the editor, Jennifer Tijera, also received the writing credit. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what that collaboration was like and that process of kind of working with the editor and with the Sanfords to sort of piece together what this story is about and how it how it comes to some sort of a conclusion. Absolutely, and thanks for mentioning Jen because she she was and is you know like the probably the largest creative force behind the film. Really, you know, um, we we yeah, there there was. I think sometimes for us we had we had all lived it and been there over these 20 years and so not only was there all that footage but there was all the other moments in life that were in our heads and right. in our memories and so it, it's very easy, difficult to see the forest for the trees you know and, and to see what how do you find the narrative and, and I think another challenge that we had is you know we had recorded some really powerful moments Cheryl having conversations with friends who had suffered similar losses, you know, mm -hmm. losing kids to gun violence in their neighborhood. And, and those, those moments were so powerful. And yet, the more we talked about it, and, the, and actually when, when Jen started to watch the footage and, and, you know, without knowing the Stanfords, but, you know, she, she, and, but she kind of fell in love with the family and just said, you know, the more we can stay contained to the family story, you know, the stronger it will be ultimately. That being said, we didn't want to lose sight of, of that, that there's a larger picture here. And so it was Cheryl's idea. One, one time I was walking with her past the Vietnam wall and there's, oh. you know, it's an elegant memorial with all these names. And Cheryl said, there should be a, a memorial like this for, for victims of gun violence in DC. And mm -hmm. which she's right, you know, that would be a really powerful thing. But yeah. so we thought, well, well, how can we, how can we do that? And so we did this wall of names at the end of, of the film where you see mm -hmm. that you know, Emmanuel's story is one story, but there's hundreds, really thousands of other kids and just in DC alone. And you right. multiply that toward all the cities where this is happening and and you start to understand the, the vast scope of this issue and that, you know, you could make a film about really any of these young men or women and 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 who, who all are from, you know, ha have loved ones, mm -hmm. their losses felt in their communities, you yeah. know? And so, um, but but you're right, yeah, it was, it was, it, it was I almost felt insurmountable at times to to tackle uh, this edit and, and it took us definitely like two or three years to really find our way through it but I but Jennifer Teixeira is amazing and um, really uh, you know she brought so much vision to it as well mm -hmm. so well and I, I think that moment that you mentioned of the wall of names at the end is such a powerful sort of apex that the movie comes to. And it also, um, that moment particularly struck me because all of the sound cuts out and all of the, the music cuts out and we're left to just sit with those names for a moment. And so afterwards, um, mm. because of that absence of sound at that point, it got me thinking about the role that music had been playing in the rest of the, the project as a whole, particularly since you're not on screen very much as a presence yourself, but the music kind of gives you a, a mode or a voice that you can sort of comment on the action through. And then as I was watching the credits, I noticed that you had actually participated in the composition of some of these pieces. So I, I was yeah. really curious if you could it, talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's awesome that you thought about it in that way that the music is a way for me, if I'm not in the film, like to still comment, I guess, on on what what was happening and what emotions might be running through me, right. um, I, a friend, a good friend of mine is he lives in Denver, Colorado. Nick Urata, um, um, he's he's known for um, well, he, he's he's a well known and loved musician, but um, he's a beautiful composer. So he we we had a lot of conversations about what what emotions we wanted to underline and and or bring out, you know, and he did a beautiful job doing that. Late, late in the edit, there was a few moments where, the, you know, we, ha we had a couple other songs that were pulled from various sources and we just weren't able to use them for, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, all the rights issues and stuff like that. So that. <laughs> um, me, I, I, I hadn't played my cello in like about uh, 20 years, but I, it's oh, still wow. like a beloved instrument to me. And Derek 
of Vanderhorst, our, our sound mixer, we, we kind of had like two days or three days to like replace some songs. So um, it was actually really meaningful to me to, uh, it's crazy, but to, to pull out a cello and, yeah. and, and use it to try to channel the emotions I was feeling. I, I got emotional playing it and, and you know, they're, they're, they're very simple songs that, you know, there's just a few notes here and there as to accent moments in the film, but, but it, it was, I've always loved that instrument. Um, when I hear it in any song and so it, it was nice to be able to ch chime in in, yeah. my, in in that way in that way yeah oh that that so makes me want to go back and rewatch with that knowledge in mind that's um I'll, that's so cool yeah I'll share I'll share with you like the couple spots where where, where we did experimented and but, but it, it, I think yeah cool well and I I also I was curious I'm I know this um obviously as many films have had to do, this film had to delay its release because of the pandemic. Now that it's finally getting the chance to hit screens, um, what do you hope the audience will take away when they leave after those, those sure. last few cello songs finish? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, look, no, no one should have to go down the street to a t-shirt shop to you know, make a memorial t-shirt for their brother, son, uncle, you know, fiance, like no one should have to clean the blood off the floor of their loved one, you know? And so I, I think, you know, it, the film, we, we hope the Sanfords and I, you know, that, that, that it is a cry for change and, and, and uh, can be used as a tool for change. We've been linking with some really great organizations, Every Time for Gun Safety, um, Black Lives Matter DC. Um, we've been doing screenings for them, uh, with them and, 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 uh, and there's a lot of other great organizations that already do great gun violence prevention work in neighborhoods around the country. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they've told us that, that the film is so meaningful to them because it, it can, um, you know, it, it just, it, it, it just, uh, it dovetails with the work they've already been doing, the great work they've been doing to, to you know, and, 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 and it's not just gun violence, you know, uh, Mike, Michael Sean Spence from Every Town for Gun Safety, he talks about how gun violence is, is a symptom mm -hmm. of, you know, it's the result of all these other systemic uh, right. challenges that you mentioned early on. And, and when you're living in areas that are forgotten and where education is underfunded and, mm -hmm. and as is recreation and, and, the unjust sentencing laws and all these things, you know, sort of it create a perfect storm where gun violence arises. So you have to first treat those root causes. Right. Um, and so, so if the film helps people, you know, at, at, at its basic level, like Cheryl said, I just want people to be able to walk in my shoes. And, and mm -hmm. so if, 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 if it, if people outside the neighborhood, you know, get a better sense of what it's like to live in a neighborhood like this and what the challenges are, like, that's really helpful. It's building awareness and it makes people ask, how, how can we help? Mm -hmm. one one small thing and people within the neighborhood have told us that it, it really is articulating their experiences and you know they've been through this themselves and so it's meaningful for them to see it on screen and to see you know that they're they're not the only ones that have dealt with some of these things and and so um i mean they, they know that but but just that sanford's have been so generous about being so open and honest and, and, and vulnerable in in yeah. sharing their story um, on, on a small sort of DIY scale, the Sanfords and I, um, right after Emmanuel passed, we started our, our organization called Washington to Washington. Um, Cheryl had the idea, why don't we take some kids from this neighborhood and just get them outside of the neighborhood, do something else. And she, she, know, she knows how much I like camping and hiking. I always talk about that. You know, when I lived in New Mexico, I was hiking every single day up and around Taos and, and, and I had showed her pictures, had shown pictures to the family and told them stories. And she said, Look, let's actually do that. So the first year we had, it was right the summer after Emmanuel passed, we had like 12 kids from, from their block that came with us from Washington, DC to, to Mount Washington in New Hampshire for a huge hike, you know, and then every year we've, it's grown. So, you know, we've been doing it for 10 years now. Last trip, we had 60 kids from wow. DC, Detroit and New Orleans as well. And, um, and it's really powerful. I mean, we camp out, hike, swim, canoe, and, you know, it's a week in the woods isn't going to cure every problem that these kids are facing, but but it can be really transforming and magical and and so and it's just funded through individual donations. People chip in twenty bucks, fifty, a hundred bucks. Our friends and and each year we're able to piece this trip together. So if people if people are curious, I, I 
really encourage them to check out our website. It's Washington to Washington.org. Um, and you can find it from the 17 blocks film website as well. Um, but so we're proud of that. We've taken hundreds of kids on the trip every year. And, and so that's just one small way to try to create more opportunities and, and change some outcomes for kids growing up in places like Southeast DC. Right. Well, and I, it, I think that's such a beautiful way of kind of um, working towards what Cheryl talks about in the film of that urgent need to break the cycle of giving people some other option, some sense that there's a possibility for a better outcome. Um, and I think the film itself mm -hmm. also does that really beautifully, particularly with the ending and the sense of, um, you know, nothing is going to erase Emmanuel's loss. And yet this family is still continuing to make movies and continuing to find new ways to um, help support other people in the community that are dealing with the same kinds of systemic oppression. Um, I, you know, they're such, they're such incredibly charismatic and wonderful to watch people and wonderful to listen to. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how they're doing now, what they're up to. Are they going to work on any more movies? I'd, I'd love to see anything else that <laughs> comes from these incredibly talented people. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they're, they're such special people. They're, they're my family and um, I love them. Uh, and they're doing really, really well um, at the moment, which is uh, really uh, heartening, you know, after being, they've gone through so much. Um, Smurf was just promoted again at, at the same oh, deli that wow. you, you had just started working at, at that grocery store, you know, several, a few years ago when, when we filmed him there. But um, He's been promoted multiple times. He's one of the store's managers. Um, he's working a ton of hours, especially during the pandemic, you know, but um, he's, uh, he, he and his children are really flourishing. Um, Cheryl, they, she, uh, at, at the apartment, there was a fire a few months ago and at the, in their building and they had to move out unexpectedly. And oh. it was really challenging, especially during the pandemic to, you know, find new housing. Yeah. Just, they, but, but in the last couple months, they've been able to get resituated in, in a, it's you know it's not a great neighborhood or anything but it's it's um they, they have a nice spot and it's it's um and it, you know it's at least providing some stability so cheryl's been doing well you know we we talk as always we talk you know if not every day um uh, a couple times a week and and um yeah. trade stories and and um, denise is hanging in there too she's had certainly had some ups and downs you know and you know the, the generational trauma that you see yeah. you know invoked in the film like yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't magically go away, but, but um, that being said, um, Denise is, is doing a lot, is a lot better now and, and you know, facing her own uh, issues that, but, but I think having the right approach in the way she's working through them. So, um, and, and the kids are doing great. Justin, you know, I FaceTime with him also oh. all the time. He's, he's, now he's 13. So he's, wow. he's, you know, he's, sometimes he gets sassy with me and I have to remind <laughs> him I used to change his diapers and, you know, like, you know, uh, but 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 they're they're great kids, and and like you said, like um, they're talented, and and so I think the next the next step is to put cameras in the hands of Justin and to Kale yeah, and and some absolutely. of his co their their cousins, and and let them, you know, pick up the mantle of, of telling this this family story and the neighborhood story. Yeah, well, it, it comes ac across so clearly, and um, you know, especially that beginning portion where most of it is. Um, footage from the, the video camera, um, just this innate sense of composition, of sort of where to put the camera, what things to capture. I remember there was mm -hmm. one shot that really struck me with, I think it's Emmanuel in the graveyard at the beginning, and the camera just swoops over to an ice cream truck coming down the street. Um, and I, I can't remember the, the slogan on it now, but of course it has this sort of horribly ironic slogan in, in the context and um, yeah. just little moments like that where these clear voices come across that um, I hope we get to see more from and yeah yeah well and well, Cheryl, Cheryl's, also, Cheryl's also a beautiful writer you know she oh, wow. e even before Emmanuel passed um, but but she would share poems and stuff with me but you know she, she wrote some beautiful poems in the immediate aftermath of his death um she she wrote a long poem a few days later 
astonishingly, and this just goes to her big heart and her just amazing capacity for love, she forgave the, the two young men who had killed her son in this poem. And, and um, it's, it's really moving. So she's, anyway, she's continuing to write and, and um, we're, I'm, she's asked for some help just as she is shaping her own story in, in a more full-fledged like written version, which mm -hmm. I think it'll be great to see that come to life too. Absolutely. Oh, I, I hope that comes to fruition. That sounds wonderful. And I, I would love to see that yeah. come through. Yeah. Something that, um, you know, I, I'm sure you and the Sanfords and particularly Cheryl have, I can only imagine a lot of tough conversations about um, is the depiction of violence in the film and how to sort of, you know, you walk this very careful line between um, showing the reality of this brutal unexpected murder and also, um, you know, not wanting to dig into re-traumatizing or re-victimizing these people. Um, and so we, we only really see blood in a few places, but when we do, um, I'm thinking particularly of those shots of the cat walking through and kind of sniffing the blood a little bit. Um, mm. it, it's really um, visceral and kind of a gut punch. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you and the family worked to find that that careful balance that you achieved. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm thank you for acknowledging that because it, it has certainly it is you have to be extremely sensitive and careful in terms of finding the right you know line to walk there and um, and I think less the family themselves. I mean, they they often insisted that we include things that I would have been shy to you mm -hmm. know because. Cheryl is such a, she has such fidelity to honesty and authenticity. And she wants people to really walk in her shoes and experience what she has experienced, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was usually something shy and she, she kind of put, was help, it was helpful that she said, yeah. you know, well, uh, let's show, for example, let's show drug use on camera and let's not, not just talk about it as this mm -hmm. abstract thing. Let's make sure we film that and mm -hmm. include it in the film. And and Smurf has like this encyclopedic memory of everything we've ever filmed. So he, wow. you know, he, he would just talk about things. What he'd be like, he, like for example, when there's the fight on the street, you know, mm -hmm. he remembered a, a camera being there that night, and he was curious. We didn't even know where to find that footage. I, I didn't think it actually existed, but he remembered that it had been filmed, and and um, and so you know, and he said, let's, you know, moments that that the family isn't necessarily proud of, they they encourage us to include. Um, that being said, we had to be, I think, most more sensitive to an audience and just, mm -hmm. you know, like not, not overwhelming people's, um, you know, sensory overload or emotional overload to the point where, where they shut down. So I think that was where we tread most carefully. One, well, I, as I said, I think you did a really wonderful job of finding that middle ground where you really feel the intense horror of the situation without being um, kind of taken out of it by gore, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wish we could keep talking, but I, I feel like I've run us out of time here. It's so wonderful to get to hear you um, talking about this incredible project. I so hope um, anybody listening to this goes out and watches 17 Blocks. I really cannot recommend it strongly enough. Um, I want to go back and rewatch it tonight myself. Um, Davey, you did a really wonderful job and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about it today. Absolutely, thank you for your kind words and your, your very extremely perceptive um, questions and thoughts about the film. It really means a lot to me for someone to watch it so clearly and to, to get it at such a high level and, and just it all, you know, the things that, these are things that we've talked about with, you know, the Sanfords and I and Jen, uh, for so long and so to to know that the film is just beginning to reach people and, and yeah. we'll be able to share it with wider audiences and 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 for the, the film can have the impact that we've, we've hoped it can have it really means a lot to us so th thank you for spreading the word and for uh, you know santa fe independent film festival and, and violet crown and, and all, all the folks in, in new mexico that have been getting word out it means a lot to us so awesome and we'll we'll keep getting the word out here awesome thank you so much thanks again you. yeah